And now, session number three, Diabetes and Comorbidities. Titled by State of Art, session one. So please, I need from the chairman to come on the stage. Professor Abdelazai Bidani. Professor Abdullah bin Nehi. Professor Florian Tussi, Professor Massimo Massi Benedetti, Professor Mohammed Hassanin, Professor Munira Al Aloud.
so that it can actually improve their neuropathy. Lipids are probably as important as lowering glucose, particularly the triglycerides. This is a trial, a large trial, which was done uh, called a field study in Australia, over 10,000 diabetic patients, type 2 diabetic patients, treated with 200 milligrams of phenofibrate over five years. And what they showed dramatically is a 50% reduction in the number of minor amputations. So, again, simply giving phenofibrate, and not to people who've got hypertriglyceridemia necessarily. These are patients with a range of uh, triglyceride levels. Giving 200 milligrams over five years reduced amputation rate by 50%. This is a study, a small study, a phase 2A study, which looked at the effect of the statin, rosuvastatin, on diabetic polyneuropathy. Again, there was an improvement in nerve conduction velocity by giving rosuvastatin over a short period of time. So, for neuropathy, it seems that Glucose control is important, maybe not as effective in type 2 diabetes. Phenofibrate is important. Statins are important. But the most recent data also suggests that treatment with a GLP-1 agonist, uh, in this case, this was from the LEADER trial, showed that if you give liraglutide, then you can reduce the risk of small but significant reduction in the risk of a foot ulcer leading to an amputation if you're on the raglatide as opposed to on placebo. So you can actually have a significant reduction by about 10% of amputations of the foot just by giving GLP-1 therapy. And this is on top of maximal control of blood pressure um, and lipids. So, is this because of neuropathy? Well, we've done a study, actually, um, in Qatar, where we looked at the effects of exenatide once weekly or insulin in diabetic patients on neuropathy. And what did we find? Well, we actually took patients who had very poor glycemic control, HbA1c of 10.5%, on metformin or a sulfonylurea. We then randomized to GLP-1 therapy, exenatide once weekly with pyoglisone, or basal bolus insulin. And the HbA once you brought down by about 3%. And what did we see in terms of the nerves? We actually saw regeneration of nerve fibers, which we assessed in the cornea. And we actually now have a paper together for this, showing for the first time that GLP-1 therapy or even insulin actually cause regeneration and repair of nerve fibers. By the way, this talk is freely available to all of you. You just have to contact the organizers and they will give you the link you download the talk. What about painful neuropathy? We know that one in five Patients get painful neuropathy. So, how do you treat painful neuropathy? Well, you have a choice. You have either the voltage gated alpha 2 delta ligands, which is pre gabapentin or gabapentin. You have the SNRIs, which is duloxetine or venlafaxine. Or you have the tricyclic antidepressants if patients can't afford it. This is the latest 2017 ADA DPN consensus statement which says to you, you have a choice of either, or if you have side effects with the higher doses of any drug, then use combinations of different drugs. So you could, for example, combine low-dose pregabalin with low-dose duloxetine. Similarly, you could use a tricyclic in a low dose with a gabapentinoid. And, and that's the kind of, at the moment, the way forward. 
for painful diabetic neuropathy. The other thing that I want to draw your attention to is something that I think is really works, and particularly so in the Middle East. Uh, since I've been in, in Qatar for like four or five years, I, I probably choose this therapy above the other therapies, <coughs> which is vitamin D. And what we showed, actually almost seven years ago, uh, was that if you have painful diabetic neuropathy, then the level of vitamin D that you have is half of what it is if you don't have pain for the neuropathy. This data has been, again, looked at by the Sheffield Group, Solomon Test Phase Group, but they show exactly the same, that if you have painful diabetic neuropathy, vitamin D is half of what it should be in painless diabetic neuropathy. And what we've done, actually, is gone on and given vitamin D, high dose, 600,000 international units, and we've shown that over 20 weeks, there is a reduction in pain scores. And this, incredibly, was with a starting level of vitamin D of 31 nanograms per mil. Most people would say 31 nanograms per mil is normal, but actually, despite it being 31 at baseline, when we gave the vitamin D, it went up to 46, and pain scores came down significantly. And these pain scores were as impressive as duloxity, as pregabalin, as tricyclin. Postural hypertension. This is the latest recommendations for the diagnosis of neurogenic as opposed to non-neurogenic hypertension. How do you do it? Well, you, the patient lies down flat, five minutes, you take a blood pressure. You then sit them up and you take a blood pressure at one and three minutes. If you're healthy, then your systolic blood pressure can drop up to 10 millimeters mercury. And the diastolic actually goes up by 2.5 millimeters mercury. And your heart rate should increase by 10 to 20 beats per minute. So, so that's healthy. Now, if you have orthostatic hypertension, whether it's neurogenic or non-neurogenic, then your blood pressure, systolic blood pressure, should fall by more than 20, and the diastolic by more than 10. But, if you have hypertension already and you're being treated, then actually your blood pressure has to fall by 30 millimeters systolic and 15 millimeters diastolic. How now do you differentiate neurogenic from non-neurogenic hypertension? Very simple. You look at the heart rate. If the heart rate does not go by more than 10 beats per minute, then you have neurogenic hypertension. If the heart rate goes up by more than 10 beats per minute, then you have non-neurogenic hypertension. So once you've identified neurogenic hypertension, how do you treat it? Well, if you're not sure, send from a tilt test. If you are sure, then you do the following. You can give fluid uh, up to three liters a day, actually. Also, add salt unless they've got end-stage renal disease. Um, but the approved medication at the moment for postural hypertension, the FDA-approved medication, is midadrine or droxidoma. And the doses are given there, and what you should do is start with once a day, then increase it to three times a day. So midadrine or droxidoma. The non-approved therapies that also can work are fludrocortisone, but you have to be aware of hypokalemia and edema, and uh, peristigium. So you've really got four choices, but the two approved ones are going to be either droxidopa or midadrine. And you can again use combinations. Erectile dysfunction. The ADA recommend every year when you see your patients, ask them about erectile dysfunction. Test their LH testosterone prolactin for hypogonadism. If the level of testosterone is less than 12 nanomoles per litre, then you should try testosterone. Because there is an effect. You shouldn't give it for anything that's higher than that. But you should consider testosterone. If they're a smoker, if you recommend cessation of smoking, then there is actually an improvement in ED by 25%. And there are trials to show this. 
So the first thing I say to my patient who's a smoker, who comes in with erectile dysfunction is, stop smoking. Pharmacological treatments, you have statins have been shown to improve erectile function, actually, uh, by a score of three, which is substantial. Um, PD-5 inhibitors work, and then there are other agents like transurethral, uh, topical alprostadil, intracavernosal injections, vacuum devices, and penile prosthesis. What about diabetic retinopathy? How do we manage diabetic retinopathy? Well, I think the best evidence that we have is from the ACCORD study, where essentially they compared lowering glucose, what was the impact? Giving phenofibrate, what was the impact? Lowering blood pressure with an ACE inhibitor, what was the impact? And what you see here is actually that lowering glucose benefits, and it benefits actually by 0.67 uh, reduction, so about 30, 30 plus percent reduction in progression of retinopathy by improving glucose. But look at the glucose. HbA1c came down from less than 8% to, to actually almost near normal. Okay? So coming down to 6.5%. Whereas, look at what happens with phenofibrate. Just giving 200 milligrams phenofibrate in the Accord study actually had a greater impact on retinopathy than, than normalizing glucose. So we need to think about using phenofibrate more and more, not just in the patients with the hypertrichosteridine. <coughs> Blood pressure was actually interesting because it didn't really show an impact. And the phenofibrate data from the PEEL study shows very clearly three different measures of retinopathy. Macular edema, progression to proliferative retinopathy, and a combination of both phenofibrate, 200 milligrams over five years, significantly reduces progression on all three counts. And in fact, based on that, in Australia, phenofibrate has a license for retinopathy. If you're on statins, there is now data from a big population-based study um, in the Scandinavian countries, which shows that you can actually prevent the development of microvascular complications. In particular, retinopathy, you see the top, neuropathy with uh, uh, amputations, but not really an impact on, on, on nephropathy. So it seems that statin use has a benefit for retinopathy and for neuropathy. What about diabetic nephropathy? So for diabetic nephropathy, there are two endpoints that we look at. Proteinuria and GFR. Proteinuria is short-term trials which show a reduction in proteinuria, and GFR are longer-term trials which are looking at doubling of serum creatinine, falling of the EGFR to less than 30, or the requirement for dialysis. And what are the data to suggest that any of these treatments work? Because in traditionally, Diabetic nephropathy is treated with blood pressure lowering agents. The evidence is that actually very little works so far, except for ACE inhibitors, angiotensin receptor blockers, and some data for spiral lactone. So what do you do once you've got a patient on an ACE inhibitor or an angiotensin II receptor? and they have adequate blood pressure control but their proteinuria is continuing. Remember, never combine an ACE inhibitor with an arm. There is now good data from the Nephrod-D study that shows that this is detrimental. It causes hyperkalemia and it actually causes progression of renal failure. So never combine ACE and arm. But what can you do next? Well, you can give spironolactone. And spironolactone, not at high doses, 25 milligrams, will further reduce the blood pressure and reduce proteinuria in both type 1 and type 2 diabetes. And in fact, there is again a Cochrane review that shows that we have to think about the renin angiotensin axis beyond just the renin angiotensin. We have to think about aldosterone. And if you block aldosterone, you can see here, then actually it has an impact even when your patients are already on an ACE or an ARM. 
So if you get spironolactone in addition to an SRNR, then you reduce proteinuria further by about, on average, 0.61 grams per 24 hours. But remember, there is a complication associated with spironolactone, which includes hyperkalemia, gynecomastia, and postmenopausal pain. So you just have to watch out for those, but you can do, use low-dose spironolactone. And there are, of course, uh, the newer agents which have less of those effects, which include the plerinone and pronerinone, which have also in clinical trials been shown to benefit diabetic nephropathy. What next? Despite ACE or spironolactone, so you have a patient who's on an ACE inhibitor, is on spironolactone, still proteinuria is continuing. Well, vitamin D. So there are data published from the Steno group that show if you give activated vitamin D, 1 alpha, you can actually further reduce proteinuria and blood pressure. What next? We're running out of options now. Well, there is data with GLP-1 agonists. So the raglatide and semaglutide have both been shown to improve nephropathy. So this is diabetic patients type 2 on ACE, ARB, um, good glucose control, good blood pressure control. But when you put them on the raglatide, they further reduce the progression of diabetic nephropathy. But the only thing you have to be aware of is there is a possible signal with retinopathy, maybe worse with the GLP-1 agonist. We don't know quite what that is going on at the moment, but it certainly has an impact on nephropathy, but has, it may have a detrimental impact on retinopathy. So what next? You've got the manase, of spironolactone, vitamin D, GLP-1. What are you going to do next? Well, that's about the only thing we've got left, but actually it's probably the best thing we can do. So there are now multiple benefits of SGLT2 inhibitors, which are a kind of we know from a mechanistic point of view, and there are excellent clinical trial data from the three major classes. So we have Empereg, which is uh, empagliflozin, reduction in progression of renal impairment, and a flattening out of the EGFR. Okay, so you can prevent progression of diabetic renal disease with empagliflozin. Similarly, credence, canagliflozin, reduce progression to renal impairment. And declare, dapagliflozin, exactly the same. Reduce progression of renal impairment. So, what next? Is there anything next? Well, right at the end, maybe. And that is, there is now a drug called imarakirin, which has been tested uh, in Japan. It's a direct renin inhibitor. So this is upstream of ACE inhibition or angiotensin II receptor blockade. So this blocks at the renin uh, production of renin level. And in fact, the trial has been done. It's about 400 patients with type 2 diabetes. And they've looked short term, 12 week study, on proteinuria. And what they show actually is that increasing dose of americarin reduced proteinuria maximally is the highest dose, which is 40 milligrams, by 38%, which is comparable to an angiotensin II receptor blocker. So I think that it has, drug has a place in the future, but it will only be um, if your patient can't tolerate ACE or R. Um, they don't know what the combination might do yet, but so that's so far. What next? The last drug, is actually, data just being published in the Lancet, is an endothelin A receptor antagonist. How does that work? Well, actually, this works at the endothelial cell level. So we know that we have nitric oxide, which is being produced, which is a vasodilator. Endothelin is a vasoconstrictor. And that also, if you could block that, may have a beneficial effect on diabetic nephropathy. I'm finished. Uh, and there are data in, the, in this trial that show when you're on maximal A's are, and you add in an DNA receptor antagonist, you can actually have an effect on renal impairment. But beware, there is a signal for heart failure with this drug. 
Um, and this is actually just showing you the effects in terms of uh, uh, AMP, BMP. You can see it goes up when you treat patients with this particular endothelial layer and agonist. And although not significant, there was an increased risk of heart failure in these patients. So we don't know what will happen to this drug, whether it will get pulled or not, but so there is possibly a role for endothelial A receptor antagonists. Thank you.